Hardware Accelerated GPU Scheduling is a new feature to the Microsoft Windows 10 update for version 2004, May 2020 edition. So this has now been supported by both NVIDIA and AMD via driver packages at this point. The feature is not to be confused with DirectX 12 Ultimate, which shipped alongside the May 2020 update, but is mostly a different thing. And hardware uh, accelerated GPU scheduling is supported on Pascal and Touring cards from NVIDIA, and it's supported on the RX 5600 and 5700 cards from AMD. So it's gotten a lot of discussion lately, and in today's content, we'll first walk through what exactly this feature is supposed to do, what it means, and then we'll show some benchmarking and performance testing for how it behaviorally affects the performance of the system. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-Lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermal significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. Before anyone jumps too far ahead in the content, the main thing that a lot of people have discussed online thus far has been focused entirely on the GPU, and that's because the name, GPU Scheduling, would maybe point people in that direction. But another thing to consider is just like with modern APIs, once we moved away from DX11, a lot of the change can be realized elsewhere in the pipeline. Because when you improve the efficiency somewhere, like with DX11 to 12 and Vulkan, you're improving the uh, efficiency by removing an abstraction layer from the OS and allowing more direct control over the hardware. Whenever you remove an abstraction layer like that, you're potentially improving the performance for the CPU, not just the GPU. So that's something we really need to look at today. A lot of the discussion has also been about latency, and as we go through and explain how this works, it'll be key that you listen out for specifically how latency is expected to be impacted and when, because it's not always going to be impacted. And people have sort of run away with this in online discussion where everybody's expecting some latency improvement, small or large, and in a lot of cases, that's not going to materialize depending on how you use your system and what you're doing with it. So enabling hardware accelerated GPU scheduling does require Windows 10 version 2004, which we've obviously installed for this. We have a complete fresh OS for this one. It requires a supported GPU, and then the latest drivers for that GPU are also obviously required. For NVIDIA, that's going to be version 451.48, and for AMD, it's version 20.5.1 beta. And with those requirements satisfied, a switch labeled hardware accelerated GPU scheduling will appear in the Windows 10 graphics settings menu. If you go through the settings interface and it's off by default. Enabling the feature does require a reboot, but it's a simple toggle to do so. And this switch is also the only visible sign of the new feature. We didn't see anything anywhere else. Uh, the best first party source of information thus far has been an updated post on the Microsoft official dev blog. And this describes how hardware scheduling works in broad terms. We should also note at this point that it's very clear from this dev blog by Microsoft, if you read it, that Microsoft has bigger, longer term ambitions for this uh, approach to things that aren't necessarily going to be realized immediately. So the Windows Display Driver model or WDDM GPU scheduler is responsible for coordinating and managing the multiple different applications submitting work to the GPU for, through the system. And this relies on uh, a quote, high priority thread running on the CPU that coordinates, prioritizes, and schedules the work submitted by various applications, end quote. That's from Microsoft. The GPU may be responsible for things like rendering, but the CPU does still bear the bulk of the workload for preparing and submitting commands to the GPU. You often hear about draw calls, similar story there. So doing this one frame at a time is inefficient. So a technique called frame buffering has become common, where the CPU submits commands in batches. This increases overall performance, which could materialize or manifest as increased frame rate, but it also uh, increases input latency, where the user might push a button and see the response on, at the next GPU uh, run of those batch frames that it's processing. So the larger the batch, the longer the potential wait in this described scenario. The Microsoft blog does further describe frame buffering as practically universal at this point. One thing that we should note as well is that several games allow adjusting the size of the buffer or disabling it entirely, and sometimes you get that option through the GPU driver packages in the control panel as well. Hardware accelerated GPU scheduling offloads the work from that high priority CPU thread and instead gives it to a, quote, dedicated GPU-based scheduling processor. 
The fact that cards as far back as Turing and presumably Pascal based on Nvidia's help documentation have the hardware to support this feature implies that it's been in the works for some time now. Microsoft describes the handover as, quote, akin to rebuilding the foundation of a house while still living in it, in the sense that this is a huge change that will ideally be invisible to the end user. The most explicit description offered in this post is this, quote, Windows continues to control prioritization and decide which applications have priority among contexts. We offload high-frequency tasks to the GPU scheduling processor, handling quantum management and context switching of various GPU engines. End quote. So nowhere in the post does Microsoft directly claim in an explicit sense that applications will run faster. Instead, they almost go out of their way to say that users shouldn't notice any change. As usual, this hasn't stopped the internet and its infinite wisdom for looking for magical improvements where they might not even exist. But that's not been helped by NVIDIA and AMD, who have almost implicitly encouraged this with vague but positive wording. For example, on NVIDIA's driver update notifications, it says, this quote, this new feature can potentially improve performance and reduce latency by allowing the video card to directly manage its own memory. From AMD, quote, by moving scheduling responsibilities from software into hardware, this feature has the potential to improve GPU responsiveness and to allow additional innovation in GPU workload management in the future. Both of these descriptions allude to latency, as does the Microsoft Post. This opens up two areas of improvement for testing, summarized by the description in the graphics menu, which reads, reduce latency, and improve performance. The first is input latency, which we can and have tested during our coverage of things like Google Stadia. But we don't think this is as big of a deal as some people expect it to be. Microsoft's blog post describes hardware-accelerated GPU scheduling as eliminating the need for frame buffering, which is a known source of input latency. And just to reiterate here, it's definitely possible to see improvements, but the degree to which you might see an improvement is maybe less than some of the internet is hoping for. And further still, as AMD points out in its own documentation, there's a direct pointing towards in the future, which is definitely what Microsoft's looking at as well. This is a longer term thing, so we might not see overnight improvements. Based on the description then, hardware accelerated GPU scheduling shouldn't reduce input latency any more than presumably simply disabling frame buffering, which is something that you can already do. This is built into the options of many games these days, and it's also built into, again, the control panel of a lot of GPU driver packages, depending on what you're looking at. So the second area of potential improvement then is in the frame rate or the frame time, if you prefer, because one is derived from the other, of CPU-bound games, since some amount of work is offloaded from the CPU by embarking on this uh, option. The logical assumption is that this effect would be most noticeable on low-end CPUs that hit 100% load in games. This is likely more than would be the case in GPU-bound scenarios, where you're looking at things like GPU VRAM constraints or GPU constraints in general and running a higher end CPU. This is something that's been tested at least in initial sense from some of the other outlets out there and a lot of them haven't really seen much of a change thus far in a, uh, a high end CPU and constrained GPU scenario. For testing, we started out with an i3-10100 with hyperthreading disabled to create an extreme CPU bottleneck on a modern system. And then we did some verification testing with an i9-10900K. These results aren't comparable to other CPU benchmarks we've done in the past. We're using a fresh install of a different version of Windows with different drivers and different software included on this install. On top of that, we've disabled hyperthreading on the i3. We encountered in all tests, gaming tests here, lower than normal 0.1% lows regardless of settings, but this isn't anything to do with GPU scheduling, it seems, and is instead a change in the methodological approach and a change in other variables within the test environment. Remember, because this is a one-off test, we're not adhering strictly to the exact same testing policies that we've outlined in our CPU testing methodology documentation for 2020. So you can't compare them head to head because of the changes listed. As we get into the testing data, there's one other note. Expect to see some negative scaling and some results. We've discovered at least one game that has significant performance loss from enabling GPU scheduling. And it looks like Nvidia has also posted patch notes where it has notified users of the same bug, except for a different game. This implies to us that more of these types of bugs are out there, so don't be shocked if you see low performance with this feature in some instances. It's still very early in development. Hitman 2 showed no difference between tests. The percent scaling is actually fairly close to GTA's, which we'll see later, but with lower overall average frame rate since it's a different game. 
we're going to run out of ways eventually to say that there isn't any noticeable change between these results. But there are a few games where there are some interesting differences. This held true for both the i3-10100 with four threads enabled and the i9-10900K with all 20 threads enabled for this game. Average FPS is 138 for the GPU scheduling disabled 10900K result or 137.6 for the enabled result. That's run-to-run -run variant. The 1% lows posted 63.9 averaged against all the repasses versus 64.8 1%. So once again, that's variant. Here's a frame time plot to show the i3-10100 with hyper-threading disabled. Frame time plots are the truest empirical representation of player experience and show frame-by-frame -frame rendering intervals as measured in milliseconds. We have no abstractions here, and this is the base metric of time. Remember that four core four threads means we'll run into a lot more frame time variability than in its stock four core eight thread configuration. If we draw one line and then the other, you'll see that they plot almost exactly on top of each other. Just like in the abstraction from the base metric of time, FPS, we're seeing that this particular data set is nearly identical with scheduling on and off. The 10900K would produce a similar frame time plot, but this is the more important one. F1 2019 showed more significant scaling on the 10100 than in some of the other tests, but in the wrong direction. Let's start with the 1% lows. For the 10900K, they're functionally equivalent. We're seeing 123.1 FPS average and 123.4 FPS average 1% low. That's within our variance run to run for this set of data. The 10100 shows similar results at 79.5 versus 75.4, which is right at the border of testing variance for the less granular 1% lows. We have a range of about plus or minus 2 FPS 1% low for this data set, so that's just at the outer bound. This is repeatable, and the enabled result is consistently lower than the disabled result for the 10100's 1% low numbers. For the averages, the 10900K posted results that are again functionally identical at 276.4 and 276.3. It's hard to get this kind of consistency even when we want it, so it's fair to call these the same. For the 10100, the result is outside of run-to-run -run variance for this set of test data and is repeatable. We're seeing a decrease of about 2.4% in average FPS from 167 to 163 at 1080p. That's not enough to affect the game or even notice it as a player, but it's a repeatable and measurable result, at least in these early stages of the feature on our test platform. In checking some data from Tom's hardware and its earlier runs with a different approach from ours, Tom's also saw negative scaling in some applications. So this, so far, aligns with our data. Here's a quick frame time plot of the 10100 4 core 4 thread configuration for F1 2019. This first plots the enabled result. The disabled result consistently plots under the average peaks, not the highest peaks, and so the frame time numbers again align with the frame rate numbers previously, which obviously one's a division of the other, so that makes sense. In a way, this lends more confidence to otherwise a very close data that's almost too close to call. It looks like the disabled result is consistently a bit ahead of the enabled result, at least, again, with this platform config and the game. At 1440p, we saw an average FPS decrease of 1.6% from 164 FPS to 162 FPS. The 10900K's average was at the border of variance for this data set, and in these early stages of the feature and with such close together results, it's tough to speak with absolute confidence on the numbers. But so far, that's what we're seeing from our test platform. Best case, they're about the same and they're so close that it's hard to firmly call a difference. Running the 10900K for verification resulted in no change, negative or positive. Red Dead Redemption 2 is the really interesting one. This had clear problems with hardware accelerated GPU scheduling with both Vulkan and DX12 for the APIs, but we're just gonna focus on the DX12 numbers for this piece. We're aware that at least one other game has significant performance issues from NVIDIA's driver patch notes, where they specifically name low performance in Divinity Original Sin 2 as a fixed issue. There's not much point in discussing percentages and relative performance here. This is a bug, and presumably at some point, it'll be fixed, just like the previous hyper-threading debacle that we discovered in Red Dead 2. There's a chance that this bug is related to that one, since the 10900K was completely unaffected. The reason we bring it up at all is that this feature is in its early days, and it's likely that there will be other games with incompatibilities that we haven't found. We're aware that other outlets have tested Red Dead 2 and haven't experienced the same issue, so it's not universal overall. Again, we'd point toward the bug we discovered at Red Dead's launch pertaining to hyperthreading, since we've intentionally disabled that on the 10100. There may be some sort of link between the behavior. Frame times for Red Dead show this problem pretty well. The 10100 with GPU scheduling enabled ran around 18 milliseconds at the beginning, with higher spikes later. The 10100 with GPU scheduling disabled ran at around 10 to 11 milliseconds and was less spiky overall. Of all the games in the test suite, Grand Theft Auto V is the best suited to a four-core, four-thread CPU, even if it's artificial. 
The increase from 93 FPS to 94 FPS average is still not outside of the range of random variance for this set of data. We've seen tiny amounts of positive scaling in enough instances by now to conclude that GPU scheduling is probably helping maybe a little bit, but on a scale that's too small to be reliably measured, much less appreciated. The 10900K's results are even closer together nearly identical in overall averages and in lows. The Division 2's results were some of the closest so far for the 10100, with near identical averages across the board when CPU bottlenecks, regardless of whether hardware accelerated GPU scheduling was used. The GPU bottleneck results for the 10900K had slight negative scaling, similar to the behavior that Tom's hardware noted in this title. The same work is being done by a different piece of hardware, so some performance difference is to be expected, positive or not. The battle benchmark for Three Kingdoms has a similar result, with the scheduling enabled average technically higher, but by less than 1%. We can see from the 10900K's significantly higher average frame rate that the 10100 is indeed a heavily bottlenecking performance, as it has in all tests so far. Part of the problem may be that even if the hypothesis about low-end CPUs benefiting from GPU scheduling is true, games rarely come anywhere close to sustaining truly 100% CPU load, and such instances are more likely synthetic anyway. The 10900K behaved similarly, with a technically higher FPS average when the GPU scheduling feature was enabled, but not enough to be considered significant. In summary then, we didn't really see significant improvement in any games. We saw one really massive issue where a bug was present in Red Dead 2, but overall for titles where there weren't bugs, it just seems like it's all about the same for the most part. So we haven't seen any other outlets report huge improvements either. We typically don't really look at the work other people do just because we're so focused on what we do. But for this one, just for sake of validation, after doing all of our testing and writing, we went and looked around. And for those who have run tests similar to these, it looks like they're more or less within what we're seeing, which is variance that's close enough that it's really difficult to confidently state if it's a meaningful difference or if it's a difference that uh, is contingent upon changing the GPU scheduling behavior. Now, one point is that we tried to fill a gap where others hadn't yet explored too much. Most of the other outlets, the few that have run these tests, have done so with more of a focus on a GPU constraint or a VRAM constraint or similar, whereas we took the opposite end that some of them started to speculate on, which was a CPU constraint with a 10100 and obviously 10900K just for baseline. And even in this scenario, plus the ones that the others have done thus far, it's pretty rare that you see any difference outside of variance, and when you do, it's an irrelevant difference. So this is, maybe if we went through our entire inventory of CPUs and GPUs, we could find a hardware combination where it would really matter but we'd be just as likely to find more games with bugs like the one Red Dead has and the one Divinity has. So right now, this lines up with what Microsoft has stated. Microsoft has openly stated the following, quote, users should not notice any significant changes. Although the new scheduler reduces the overhead of GPU scheduling, they said, most applications have not, or have been rather, designed to hide scheduling costs through buffering. So the post in, question was written several days after the public release of the feature. They obviously had time to gauge public response. And given that everyone had ample time to get hyped up and hunt for numbers that just aren't there, it looks more like Microsoft is responding to that hype and saying, uh, hey guys, let's, let's dial it back a little bit. We weren't really saying that. And this data seems to support that statement from Microsoft. So this update is not designed to directly improve performance today in games. It's designed to enable unspecified future features that we can't know about right now. So uh, no major change and looking at frame time performance, whatever, it doesn't matter. A lot of people are also mixing up the word latency or people, a whole different thing, but a lot of people are expecting differences in frame times because of the word latency being tied to input latency and other latencies. So uh, at the end of the day, the results are what we showed, which is almost no difference. Sometimes there's a bit of one, but it can be in either direction. And a bit of one means we're not even, in most instances, able to, you're definitely not able to see it as a player. Uh, and then the only time it really mattered was, again, Red Dead, where it's a bug. So that's it for this one. Thanks for asking about it. If you have other requests for us to look into things like this, always feel free to tweet at Gamers Nexus or post in the comments. We keep an eye on all of that so we can try and uh, service those requests. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to support us directly when we do these types of user requested content pieces. And you can pick up things like mod mats, posters, or other items. The X570 Metro chipset poster is back in stock. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.